Okay, well, thank you everyone for, for tuning in our August, uh, August talk. We, have the, uh, we had the honor of having Jonathan Rod, um, who accepted to give us a presentation remotely from, uh, from Toronto, while well, everybody's remote at this point, but uh, <laughs> thank you for taking the time. It's later in the day for you. Um, so maybe I can, I can say a, a, few, a few words. Uh, so Jonathan is the president of, uh, of uh, or co-president, I see on your slide, <laughs> of Diaz uh, Geophysics. Uh, he had a long career in geophysics, so before AeroQuest for seven years, uh, Quantech for uh, over two years, and now uh, Diaz, I see almost six years. Is that right, uh, Jonathan, almost six years? Yeah. Excellent. It's good. Uh, it was a great timing for you to turn your, your mic back on. <laughs> okay, so um, I guess without further ado, uh, I'll, I'll let you uh, give your talk and then we're going to have a, um, a question comment sessions uh, right, right after. Uh, we now have the chat uh, activated, so feel free to, uh, if you don't want to speak out loud, feel free to leave questions there and I'll, I'll ask them directly to Jonathan after. Jonathan, the floor is yours. Great. Thanks a lot, Dom. Thanks uh, <clears throat> to the BCGS for, uh, for inviting me to present today. Um, uh, today I'll be talking on uh, two airborne systems, as the title says, both of which have uh, squid sensor technologies. Uh, as Dom mentioned, <clears throat> I'm uh, co-president of DS Airborne uh, and president of DS Geophysical. A little confusing. They're kind of sister companies, I guess. I'll explain that in a moment. And um, <clears throat> this, uh, this presentation is, uh, uh, is on two technologies that now are being run through uh, DS Airborne. So I'll see if I can, there we go. So the, uh, the two technology names are, uh, are QMAG-T and QAMT. One is a uh, full tensor mag radiometer system. That's the QMAG-T system. And the second is a uh, airborne uh, passive EM system called QAMT. First, I thought I would just spend a, a minute or two uh, describing the relationship between DS Airborne and DS Geophysical. DS Geophysical has been around for six years <clears throat> now, as Dom mentioned. Uh, DS Airborne has been just recently crafted. It's a it's a a partnership between DS Geophysical and uh, Supercon. Uh, Supercon, I'll describe also in a, in a minute or two, uh, is, a, is, is our technology partner in Germany. My co-president uh, is the um, managing director of Supercon, uh, Matthias Meyer. So just a, just a couple slides about DS Geophysical. DS Geophysical uh, carries out induced polarization resistivity surveys and uh, now more, most recently have, has added magnetotelurics uh, to our capabilities. <clears throat> and we've been around, as, as mentioned, six years. Uh, we, we design, manufacture our own equipment, uh, carry out our own surveys, um, provide uh, full uh, processing and uh, QC of these data sets and then deliver them high volume data sets. We do limited modeling. We prefer to hand off these data sets to uh, consulting groups uh, to carry them forward. Um, just a, a, a quick map of the surveys we've done so we know we're globally active globally and uh, are, 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 uh, are comfortable in uh, operating in these environments. Now COVID-19 has thrown a bit of a twist into this so um, a little more challenging to get around the world right now. Um, so our technologies, as mentioned, are DS32, GS5000 transmitters, a new transmitter, Caravel, which is a modeling uh, uh, software, it's a 3D inversion and modeling capability, Magnetotelurics, HSCC, and we're committed to sort of ongoing R&D. Supercon is our, our partner in, in this uh, DS Airborne venture. Uh, Supercon has been around, uh, or at least the roots of Supercon are, go right back to 1913. <clears throat> uh, back uh, in uh, and uh, in through 1962, when um, um, these supercurrents were di discovered, and then in '68, when uh, Jena University, which is in Germany, where Supercon is based, East Germany, um, 
uh, when they got involved in this. And they, they developed their first squid sensors in 69, um, and in 77, their first thin films. Um, this manufacturing uh, process. And then in 1993, they, they founded this um, uh, the cryoelectronics group at IPHT, which is a research group uh, based in Jena, uh, Germany as well. And then uh, shortly after that, in 1995, the first squid sensors um, uh, for TEM uh, were, uh, were generated. In 1999, Anglo-American uh, starts a long-term R&D program, which has lasted uh, right up until the present uh, time. They continue in a part of that research, um, so over 20 years, and have seen uh, the development of several systems uh, through that time, one of which is one of the ones we're discussing today. Um, in, in 2001, uh, Supercon itself was, uh, was um, formed. The Supercon's purpose is to commercialize the developments that are coming out of these R&D um, R&D uh, collaborative and the R&D efforts that IPHC is undertaking. So a quick profile of Supercon. Uh, their vision is to just uh, demonstrate um, the value of quantum detectors um, in, in various industrial applications. They have um, a, a lovely facility there. You can see in the bottom right, they have their clean room, which is on the right, the white side of the building. Uh, which is where they fabricate the, the uh, squid detectors, squid sensors, and they have uh, office and lab facilities in the uh, blue and white side of the building. Uh, they do uh, control electronics, um, you know, obviously to, to, to take the sensor measurements and, uh, and uh, make them applicable to the application uh, that they're being used in. Uh, they have about 25 employees there. And um, if you're not aware, they've been in, in the uh, low temperature and high temperature squid space on GEM uh, surveying in the minerals industry for quite a while uh, with their Jesse Deep system. These are being used worldwide uh, with application for deep, uh, deep, T, deep TEM, high signal to noise applications. And the second on the middle there is new, more near surface imaging, so UXO, environmental type stuff. Um, uh, Sir Jesse Smart system, and then now this uh, QMAG T system, uh, which has been in operation for many years now with Anglo American, and now is being brought to market through um, uh, through DS Airborne. Uh, they've had a lot of success. We've been recognized as, uh, recognized for their success with this award in two thousand and seven uh, for their squid sensor technologies. So moving on to uh, <clears throat> the actual uh, technical side, the squid, the squid technology has a lot of uh, potential applications in airborne geophysics. And uh, we've kind of thrown up all the possibilities here. So you can see under the mag, you can do FTMG or three component vector magnetics, EM, there's a whole range of possible applications and then uh, gravity as well, uh, the full tensor gravity gradiometer uh, uh, system. The QMAG T system and the QAMT uh, systems that I'll be talking about today address uh, several of these applications, um, as you can see here. So the QMAG T is, an, is a full tensor mag radiometer system, and the QAMT um, <clears throat> uh, could address uh, a variety of applications. The one that we're focusing on today is the passive EM application, but uh, it would be sensitive for VLF uh, semi airborne and three component vector applications as well. So I'll start with uh, the QMAG T system. As mentioned, it's a full tensor mag gradiometry system using low temperature, so helium squid sensors. And on the right is a, a view from the ground of, uh, of the system in, uh, in flight. So what is the full tensor? Uh, the full of the gradient tensor is a three by three second order tensor in which you're measuring the variation in the magnetic field along each in, in three components along each of the uh, three uh, directions. So X, Y, and Z are east, west, and down, I guess, or up. Uh, so you end up with nine tensor components, and those are the B, X, 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 Y, X, Z, B, Z, X, Z, Y, Z, Z, and then the green ones. Uh, so nine components. 
So this is just an example of, of that sort of in, in more visual. It's from a paper written by Cole and Cooper, presented at SAGA in 2017. Uh, this is just a, a synthetic model of a cube, magnetic cube, um, in uh, probably in South African environment where you've got uh, uh, a slightly north, uh, north dipping um, inducing field. You've got the gradient tensor for this cube. So the, the, the top three there, the TX, TY, TZ, are the uh, X, you know, the three component mag responses. And then the nine, um, the nine boxes down in the bottom right in the brackets are the tensor components, uh, XX, XY, XZ, YX, YY, YZ, and uh, likewise for the Z. And you can see that the, there is some uh, redundancy there. So that the TX, Z is the same as the ZX, uh, TXY is the same as TYX, and, and likewise for the TYZ and ZY. So really you only have uh, these six independent tensors um, for, the, uh, for these types of systems. So this is the implementation of that, uh, of that system. Uh, this is a bird developed uh, by DS, uh, um, in Canada here. Um, it uh, comprises a platform which uh, houses the, the bird, uh, sorry, the sensor, the cryostat, and then um, all of the other components that are required inside um, the tail. And then um, it's, all, it's being flown under a helicopter at this point, as, as you can see. Uh, into the specifications, um, <clears throat> I'm not going to go into great detail here. Um, perhaps the first couple are of interest. Um, the, the sensor itself uh, comprises six uh, first order planar gradiometers. Um, so these, these, these gradiometers, these six, these six gradiometers will allow you to derive the, um, um, derive the uh, six tensor components or nine tensor components. Um, <clears throat> And the intrinsic gradient noise is very low. Very low. Um, we do have a magnetometer um, on board, a uh, fluxgate magnetometer. Um, intrinsic noise is, uh, again, two picotesla per root hertz, very low, very low noise. Operating temperature uh, is appropriate. Cryostat operation. Uh, the liquid helium takes about, um, <clears throat> uh, lasts for about two and a half days on average, depending on conditions. Um, and before it has to be refilled. So it's not like you're refilling that every day. Um, data acquisition system comprises 20 channels. Um, we have an IMU on board to measure the uh, motion uh, of the actual sensor itself uh, so that we can correct that into, uh, into a ordered coordinate system. And it comprises the uh, uh, optic gyros and the uh, accelerometers. The three component flux gate is also used uh, in, in, the, in the rotational um, correction. Uh, radar altimeter uh, and laser altimeter are standard. We use both or, or, uh, uh, for, uh, during surveying and these are actually on the bird, the bird itself. And the weight of the bird is about 170 kilograms. So it's, a, it's really quite a light weight. Um, system compared to uh, some other uh, geophysical systems. The system does not require uh, an operator to be on board, so it can go uh, pilot only. And there are no, the acquisition system is on the bird itself. So the um, requirements for um, um, permits for uh, SDCs and all that kind of stuff are, are very limited, just to the navigation system. This is an example of a, a flight line of data. Um, you can see the uh, raw on the top. So that's the uncorrected uh, six channels uh, coming off the planar, planar sensors. Uh, the second, uh, second chart there is, are the six uh, balanced uh, responses. Uh, that's after a fairly significant amount of processing, uh, which is to derive the, um, uh, derive the tensor components and then uh, and then uh, balance them. There is some redundancy in the in the tensor components, so that redundancy is used uh, to improve the uh, 
um, improve the noise statistics of, of the final data. And then the, fi the bottom is the actual final process data um, where further, further, um, further processes are applied. So this is just a general uh, <coughs> ordering of how, how the data is processed. I'm not going to go into any great detail. Um, you know, you do time synchronization, you do your GPS and IMU processing, and then uh, your three component uh, flux gate is, is uh, processed. And then the gradiometer process, which is the heart of, of this uh, system's uh, data, of course, um, there's several steps that are taken in there. And uh, the rotation of, the, of these tensor components into a um, Earth-centric, Earth-fixed um, uh, coordinate system is, is the most intensive step. And then you can do a variety of things with these data sets, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that uh, going forward here. I'm going to just walk through a, uh, a survey that was, was completed under a, a research and development program called INFACT. Uh, you can see it there. On the bottom right, you can see that the project was funded by the European Union. Um, and uh, it was flown over three sites, um, one of which um, sorry, the INFACT project was um, uh, involved three um, mineral exploration sites um, to sort of characterize deposits and to understand, better understand what, um, what methods could be applied and what new methods were available to improve exploration uh, effectiveness. And so for the Sakati deposit, which is a nickel copper PGE deposit, um, the uh, FTMG system. Um, this was actually, um, uh, yeah, the FTMG system was flown. So this deposit was discovered in 2009 by Anglo-American in Northern uh, Finland, and uh, several uh, surveys were flown over this under this program. Uh, so Air in addition to the FTMG, Airborne EM, radiometric, uh, and uh, total field mag required. So a little background, uh, it was discovered by the Anglo-American uh, Exploration Finland team, um, public, publicly available data sort of keyed them in on this area and um, it provided some targeting. Uh, they were followed up by ground geophysical methods, including low temperature squid, which would have been part of their um, uh, collaboration with uh, Supracon and base of till uh, soil geochemistry. In 2006, they did some drilling. It was um, it was suspended for a year, and then back in 2008, they came back with another more detailed survey, and they did some follow-up drilling. And the official discovery was in 2009, where they discovered uh, 150 meters of just over a percent copper, and you can see the numbers there. Uh, quite impressive. So the QMAG T survey that was flown over this um, had a line spacing of 50 meters, an average sensor height of about 49 meters. You see the lines uh, there, 61 lines, each three kilometers long, and two tie lines. The geology there shows the uh, uh, sh shows the various deposits, the the dark um, <clears throat> the dark or the brownish color are the uh, the the Ultramagnetic bodies of interest. Prehytites. And then uh, you've seen this before. This is just an example line from this survey. Um, the, uh, the actual profiles are the three X ten tensor components. The second one is the two Ys and the one Z. And then uh, the B X, B Y, B Z are derived from the tensor components. And the total magnetic field would, be, would have been derived from the um, <clears throat> from the um, flux gate. So this uh, this is the survey <clears throat> in plan for each of the tensor components. So you can see the variation in the response uh, from each of these components and the level of detail that you're uh, getting just from the imaging of of this uh, this data set.
Uh, I've included the outlines of the geology, a lot of thrust faulting in through there, and uh, I'll get into the um, into the uh, response in, in a moment here. This is a, a 3D inversion that we ran. <clears throat> uh, DS has been involved in, in uh, working with the SIMPEG group uh, in, Van in Vancouver. Uh, most of you are aware, probably aware of that. Uh, it's, a cons uh, it's an open source uh, a group that is working on the uh, SIMPEG codes, which fl fl originally flew, uh, uh, flowed out of the UBC uh, um, group. And uh, so we've been working away at these and have uh, a lot of these codes, at least for the, the codes that are useful for the data sets that we're producing uh, up and running and uh, available through our Caravel um, pa uh, platform. Uh, for this particular inversion, we ran uh, all the tensor components and the total field through. Um, the total field was added to provide uh, a little bit more depth uh, and stabilize the inversion a little bit. The output data <coughs> is the uh, Magnetic field vector would be the principal outlet and that output, and then that's uh, uh, divided up into the magnetic susceptibility response and the remnants response, so induced in remnants. So you can see the, uh, the details of the inversion that we ran. In this image, you can see the red uh, outlines. Those are the remnant, uh, that's the remnant model, and the gray is the uh, uh, induced or the, uh, the susceptibility. And uh, <clears throat> we, we found that the remnants was kind of uh, uh, focused around the outer parts of these, uh, these intrusions and the, uh, the induced response was focused toward, more towards the in, in interior of it. Uh, but you can see the complexity in the, in the models. Of course, this model will struggle with deciding what's remnant and what's, um, what's induced, uh, but provides a little more information than uh, what a total field, of course, would provide. So that's just a quick, uh, a quick go through of, uh, of one example data set with the system. Just to kind of um, review the benefits of the system. Um, the system is extremely sensitive uh, owing, owing to the, uh, um, the squid sensors and the fact that you're getting the full tensor measurement. So it's an extremely highly resolved uh, system, and I uh, got a very, um, <clears throat> very sensitive to weakly, uh, weak, weak magnetization as well. So you have improved delineation and recognition of magnetic structures. Um, and the system is, because you're measuring uh, the full tensor in, in all directions, um, you're insensitive to survey orientation. So you can fly, you might not know what your geology is doing, you can fly through an area and, um, you know, you have had the line direction wrong, uh, but still get a valid data set as long as your line spacing is, is appropriate. The other uh, advantage is if you're flying in an area where it's more operationally efficient to fly in one direction, you can do that instead of uh, the other. Remnants mapping is an obvious application of this system. You're getting the directional information. And uh, in the end, um, the, the goal is, of course, improved geologic modeling. So it uh, reduces your non-uniqueness of the magnetic field. Uh, it gives you better imaging results, more accurate and detailed uh, geologic models. So in the top on the image on the right, you can see the comparison between a conventional uh, total field survey and the, and the gridding that's, uh, that, that flows from that on the, bottom, on the southern and the eastern margins, and then the squid survey, which is overflowing the same area. You can see the added, added resolution just in this sort of grid imaging of that data set. So just to, to extend the imaging, um, as, as mentioned in the a couple slides to go, out of the inversion result comes a, a total of magnetic um, vector information. Um, so on these images, um, on the left and on the bottom, you've done some synthetic modeling of, of, uh, of kimberlite pipes or, or vertical cylinders. And um, these uh, responses can be modeled visually by, or, or shown visually by um, uh, imaging the, the modeled magnetic vector in, in 3D space. 
So you can see on the, on the top left one, you've got a, a, a remnantly magnetized source, which is um, uh, where the vectors are, are heading into the ground. And on the right, you've got an opposite direction source, which uh, with vectors are heading up out of the ground. So visually very easy to interpret these, these sources. And obviously the, the location is also fairly evident as well. So how do we how do we use this system? Um, it's it's generally not these systems haven't been available into the market. So um, other than to um, to the Anglo group, which would include De Beers, um, and um, their De Beers is uh, is you know certainly using the system, and uh, and their main application is in Kimberlite mapping and characterization. Uh, we believe that's an obvious application for the system. Um, other applications, um, you know, and I guess going back to that, uh, it's been it's been said that um, this system can be used almost as an airborne geochronology system, where you're where you know the magnetization direction of the different ages of Kimberlite pipes, so you can fly over features and uh, determine what uh, you know what age they are without even having to uh, to do any uh, geochron or other analysis. Um, the second application would be ultramafic intrusions, where you where you know you've got remnant magnetization. Um, you know how many drill holes do you drill and uh, miss the target because of uh, of, uh, of a mag uh, field which is uh, contaminated uh, by remnants. But the remnants is important, so um, and and can be actually a very uh, useful parameter to understand. So uh, this system will help in that. The um, third application we, we believe would be in real complex geology uh, or structural settings uh, where you've got uh, D1, D2, D3, and perhaps D4, and um, you know, rolled environments where you know, these might be the third or fourth deformation uh, event, which is the one that's mineralizing. So sorting out these in the magnetic data set can be very important. Uh, and the system can, uh, can certainly help in imaging um, in these complex environments. And the fourth one, uh, I, I'm not sure how much testing has been done in this, but uh, just by uh, conversations that we've had, we believe that iron ore would be a strong application for this, uh, this technology as well in sorting out what's going on in these iron ore deposits. Um, second uh, system is, uh, called the QAMT system. This is a passive EM system. Uh, it's uh, a low temperature, also again, a little low temperature squid sensor. The sensor is, is different on this uh, system, um, but the, the actual, um, I just put these all up here. The actual um, deployment is the same. So we can put the same uh, cryostat into the bird, just a different sensor. Um, so same weight, same, uh, same operational characteristics. Uh, but this system <clears throat> features a low noise three component uh, B field measurement. So a three component mag measurement. Uh, same mechanical damping and uh, inertial measurement union, uh, inertial measurement unit, which uh, allows us to, uh, to rotate the data and process the noise out of the data. <clears throat> Um, and so, and, uh, so what flows out of this data set is you get your EM, your passive EM me uh, measurements, but you also get your uh, three component mag uh, field from this. So you're doing two surveys in one and that three component mag can be a very useful uh, product. And you get a full suite of these passive EM and, and, and mag products um, that come out of it. So parent resistivity maps, sections, uh, 2D, 3D resistivity image, uh, inversion modeling, um, and then visualizations and plan section or, or boxes. And then the three component mag products, uh, as you'd expect. The advantage of this system is that uh, you're actually measuring B field as opposed to a coil system, which is DB by DT. Um, <clears throat> so it's a direct measurement of the, of the magnetic field. The oriented, uh, the fact that you're getting oriented three component mobile data uh, that is unique. Uh, other systems do measure, well, one other system measures uh, three components, um, but is not able to use those components uh, independently 
uh, because of the noise levels uh, from what we understand. Uh, we use a full tensor base station. So uh, with squid mag gives you your three, uh, three mag components and then uh, two E field, uh, orthogonal E field measurements as well. And then those data are used to produce um, the various products. Um, advantage, <clears throat> we, we think we have a, an advantage on, on, the, on the weight of the system. From what I can understand, our system is um, significantly lighter uh, than the other uh, uh, technologies that compete in this space, uh, the mobile MT and the, and the ZTEM system. Um, you can see the, the, the spe specification uh, comparison there. Um, I can't vouch for the full accuracy of these. These are kind of best guesses based on the information I have. Um, what the QAMT system is measuring, uh, again, the uh, th individual three components and has a full tensor base station, which gives us much better flexibility in the processing and interpretation of our data sets. Uh, so specifications, uh, as mentioned, three channel orthogonal squid sensor, noise levels, temperature, similar cryostat operation characteristics. Um, IMU system is uh, very similar as well to the, uh, to the FTMG. Radar and laser are the same, and the system weight is the same in the same uh, tow cable system. Again, no operator in the helicopter. Uh, everything is uh, on the bird. Um, so um, really quite lightweight and, uh, and easy to sort of plug and play. Only the navigation system requires an STC. And on the, the one point, I guess, of this, which sort of might pop out, is the uh, 33 and a, almost three to three and a half bits of noise for EDC, which uh, I don't really fully understand, but uh, it's the characteristic of the incredible uh, sensitivity of these uh, squid sensors. Um, and, um, and the advantage, of course, is in the quality of the data at the end of the day. This is just an example of an early uh, test we did of the system. Um, you can see, I can't see because that was covered over. On the top is the mobile uh, trace, and on the bottom is the base station trace for one of the components, and I don't know which one. I, I'll show another example in a second here. So this is um, another trace. This, uh, this sample is actually just under a second, so 0 0.8 seconds. Um, you have three mobile components, X, Y, and Z. Uh, you can see the individual um, responses. And then you've got the remote uh, base station uh, response there as well. You can see a 50 hertz uh, local uh, power main, so a 50 hertz um, uh, power grid response in the, in the remote or the, or the base station, um, particularly in the mag data sets. Uh, so this is just an example, uh, example data set from uh, the, the QAMT system. Uh, this was a semi-airborne uh, survey that was flown under the uh, project in Germany called DESMEX, um, which is Deep Exploration Search for Mineral Exploration. I think that's the acronym. And, um, and this was a grounded bipole um, that was used as a power source, and then the, the, the receiver was flown under a helicopter uh, across the survey and the flight pattern that you can see there. And th these data were inverted in 3D. Uh, so you can see this uh, produces a you know, very, uh, very, very excellent depth sensitivity um, um, in this particular application. But as I mentioned, there's the others. The, um, the main application would be the passive, uh, passive application. Um, yeah, maybe I'll just go back to the slide and, and, and comment that this um, the QAMT system uh, has basically been, our, our, our system itself has been stuck in, um, in a jurisdiction where we can't get it out of because of COVID uh, for the last six months. So we're, uh, we're kind of um, been stalled on, on the development and deployment of the system for the last uh, half a year. Uh, we're hopeful that it'll be out uh, and ready for surveying uh, by the you know, September, October timeframe. 
Um, so in summary, we're introducing two new airborne technologies, uh, each with unique characteristics. Um, the QMAG T system is an FTMG system with a well-established um, record uh, through Anglo-American, and it provides a new standard of measurement uh, of the, the magnetic field. The QAMT system uh, is a new passive source EM system, uh, again with low noise um, uh, characteristics. The three component measurement will improve imaging clarity and depth search in these applications. So thanks for your attention. And uh, I think uh, if there's any questions, so Dominic will sort of um, host, uh, manage those. <laughs> I'll do my best. Thank you, Jonathan. That was a great talk. I'm super happy to, uh, to uh, finally see a formal uh, talk about, uh, about the new systems. Um, so yeah, as Jonathan said, if anyone would like to ask a question uh, by voice, feel free to um, unmute yourself. Um, and also your video if you want to show your beautiful face. Um, otherwise, I can probably just start with uh, with the question that Lee asked in the uh, in the chat uh, in the chat box. I was thinking the exact same thing, and I think it's a good great question, right? So I don't know if you uh, had any uh, if you managed to fly any surveys uh, at low altitude, like uh, near closer to the equator, like in South America or somewhere like that where you know the field is a bit more ambiguous um that could uh, potentially be a huge gain so i don't know if you have any comments uh, about about that yeah so our, our understanding is yes that would this system would provide advantage in that environment uh, we have not flown surveys in low latitudes so i uh, don't have that direct experience yet yeah okay sounds <laughs> great anyone else would like to ask jonathan a question This is always the awkward moment where <laughs> lots of silence. Uh, we have another one from the chat box. I'll just uh, read it out loud for you, Jonathan. Could you please explain again how full tensor mag data can help with magnetic remnants? Yeah, so full tensor mag data is providing the directional information. And so it can resolve directional information more confidently, I guess, or accurately than, uh, than a total field measurement. You're, with a total field measurement, you're, you're not measuring direction at all. You're just measuring the lateral variation in it. So with the full tensor, you're measuring the direction as, in as many ways as possible, really. Um, the, the ambiguity comes in understanding how much is remnants and how much is induced. And there, is, there still remains some. I think you can uniquely determine, you can determine, yes, there's remnants with these data sets. Um, there is still some challenge in sorting out, uh, sorting out the, th the triumvirate, which is your geometry, your induced magnetization, and your remnants. And inversion will, you know, as any inversion will, it will come up with a, a non-unique solution for each of those. So any a priori information which is available uh, to help with locking down your geometry um, uh, will help um, but the system uh, will detect um, you know so in, if, so in the instance of a kimberlite pipe where you know what your ge geometry is in general um, uh, the system is very very will be very good at uh, determining remnants within those features where your ge where your um, geometry or your sort your source geometry is not as well known uh, it, it will become more challenging, but you can determine that, yeah, that yes, there is remnants or no, there isn't remnants. I don't know if that's helpful. <laughs> I think the reality is there's a lot of work to be done on these data sets. They've only been out in the hands of Anglo for the last, uh, you know, well, 20 years, I guess, or however long it took them to develop the initial system, 15 years ago, maybe. So they were probably the most advanced at this. Um, there's been a lot of synthetic uh, work done on these uh, these types of data sets, but uh, time will tell, and, and we recognize there will be a lot of uh, research have to go into kind of understanding how best to use these data sets. It can it can only help, right? Uh, we're going from a scalar scalar data to a vector data, and then we're trying to invert the vector quantities. So the more data diverse data, the better it is. <laughs> That's yeah, right. Certainly. Yeah. 
Anyone else would like, Lee, who would like to say something? Yeah, I thought I'd pipe in. Um, so Jonathan, um, you mentioned system of, like availability is, um, is restricted at this point in time. Like uh, what are the plans uh, for ramping up in terms of system deployment uh, internationally over the next little while? Yeah, so the FTMG system is actually on, on survey in BC right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, it'll be there for the next, well, depending on weather, for the next week or, week or two. Um, the uh, FTMG system, sorry, the, the, the QAMT system is, um, is in Africa right now and we, it has to go back to Germany uh, and, then, um, and then after that it will be available. Uh, the challenge, of course, is understanding when it's going to be able to get out of Africa. So, sure. Yep. And you're planning on running more than one system or you start, uh, start with just the one and ramp up over time? Uh, what's, what's yeah. The yeah, initially it'll be one system for each, and then uh, and then as demand ramp uh, uh, in increases, we'll be ramping it up. Yeah. Okay, great. Very interesting system, mate. Like uh, both systems are, yeah, basically able to provide uh, quite a unique uh, niche uh, and cater to a niche anyway. So it'd be interesting to see where this goes. Really looking mm -hmm. forward to seeing more case studies, Jonathan. Yeah, we would have loved to have been able to show more of them. We did. We did a program last summer, and uh, and unfortunately discovered a uh, a problem with our IMU. So a lot of that data was really we couldn't rotate it properly. So it was uh, it was not uh, not possible to drive much of anything out of it. So that was, was disappointing for us. But that's the that's the nature of development, right? You, uh, you keep going, and uh, this next data set we've collected in Africa is much better, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to show those results. No, very good. Congratulations on making the market. Yeah, thank you. I have another question from uh, Jeff. Jeff Witter. Hi, Jeff. It's been a while. <laughs> um, he's wondering if you or your team um, have uh, tried or seen uh, data sets that combine both the uh, the QAMT and um, in a ground MT survey, and because they could be complementary in terms of resolving. The near surface with the QAMT and an MT for, for deeper. So I don't know if you if you had any comments about about that. Yeah. So I've always been of the mind that uh, uh, you know having a ground MT uh, data set to integrate with uh, with the airborne is is beneficial. Um, the reality is in most uh, most applications, um, you know, that's not the purpose. Uh, you know, you, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's often seen as, uh, not reconnaissance, but it's often seen as, uh, you know, you're covering a large, large, you know, tract of ground and uh, you get your results. And going in with an MT, a ground MT survey would uh, be quite an added expense um, and with an unknown benefit, I guess. So um, I have not seen a lot of these types of data sets. Even looking over the literature at the ZTEM system and, um, uh, ZTEM system and you know the, the mobile mobile MT guys have only been out for a little bit now. Uh, there's not a lot of the, the combined. There is some work in the Saskatchewan uh, basin um, where combined data sets have been used, and I think to good benefit. I agree that it's a, it's a useful thing to do. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that uh, how that develops. Well, knowing uh, knowing Jeff uh, working on uh, geothermal systems, uh, of course, MT would would gain. Uh, much more, much more depth penetration than an airborne uh, airborne system. But uh, that, uh, as you said, it's probably work for space for future work. Yeah. Um, very well. So we are quarter past five. So maybe we'll leave another few seconds if someone else has a last minute question. Okay. Well, Jonathan, thank you very much again for your time. Um, as I said, this video will be posted on YouTube uh, not long uh, after after the end of the session. And then I hope that everyone will uh, will join us again for our next uh, our, our next talk next month. So thank you again, Jonathan. Congratulations for the good talk. <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks to all. Bye, everyone. <laughs>